I'm Nancy Steele and it's wonderful to be here today and I noticed that it's really bad outside so you won't be wanting to be out there <laughs> so that's a really good thing and um, like Lisa said I was a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing plus I taught even juveniles for three years so I've, I've been around and, and in that I was in Kentucky and in that I um, did mostly itinerant, but I also had classroom experience and then team teaching and you name it because, you know, you, you just do a mixed bag over 17 years of whatever initiatives are going through, you know? So I did a lot of that, all ages from preschool on up through 21. And um, then I decided after the, my last three years was when I taught, um, special ed by day and juveniles by night. So, you know, I really feel like with teaching, you have to like learn in order to teach. And I also felt like at that point, I had just given everything I had. So it was time for a little break. So I took a year and it's called the year of my sitting on the bench. And um, I did some consulting work for the Kentucky Deaf Blind Project. Because in that, I had uh, deafblind students, I had kids with more severe disabilities, I had kids with autism, I had a little mixed bag of a, a lot of different things. And um, so I also reflected a lot on what I learned because I feel like it's really important as a teacher to really sit back and think about what, just reflective on your practice. So then I went to work at the National Center and I worked there for 15 years. I got to go to lots of different states. Uh, my specialty was kind of classroom technical assistance and helping state deafblind projects figure out how to do that. And so I did, I was in a lot of classrooms, lots and lots of classrooms, doing lots of TA. Then also I worked as the lead on literacy and um, we developed a website that I'll talk just a little bit about today. And then there, you also should have gotten a flyer because I'll be back here in April to talk about literacy. So that's, I don't, it's not in your packet. I think Lisa has them out front. Anyway, so then I also worked on the open hands, open access uh, intervener modules. Anybody heard of those? Hmm. Okay, well there are 27 modules all about deaf blindness and that really it goes beyond deaf blindness. So does that literacy website as a matter of fact. But, but I also started my teaching career actually when I was four because I was a born teacher and my little brother got hit by a car. And when, when he woke up after six weeks of being unconscious, um, they, my parents, I was the fourth of five, and my parents brought, and he was five, and so my parents brought me in so that, to see if he would recognize me. And you know, I guess I took that personally, and also not being in school yet, I went to all of his, you know, therapies and all of those different things. And I was the one standing by the um, rails as he's trying to walk, going, of course you can. And you know, then when I went to school, I would come home in the afternoons and he was my little captive audience in his wheelchair and I would teach him everything I knew that day, you know? So I started my career early. And you know, my parents, um, I was really blessed that my parents, we were kind of unisex, everybody learned everything and every, my dad was a, a sergeant in World War II. So he had all of our little soldiers that, you know, we all did all the work around the house. They said, we don't need a dishwasher, we have five, you know. Mm -hmm. And of course my little brother had to also do those things, which, you know, he's not, you're not getting out of this. Mm -hmm. No, nah, because that might mean I would have to do it. So, you know, that's how our family ran. Today, um, he is the primary caretaker of our 90-year-old mother. So, you know, he, it's carried through and, and you need to remember that he went to public school before special ed was there. 
that he just, I don't know how my parents did that. They just, I think, just sent him. <laughs> I'm not real sure, but, <laughs> you know, anyway. So, that's a little bit about me. Now, remember I told you I, I believe in reflecting on my practice. And um, I quit at the National Center a couple of years ago and I've really sat down and reflected on what have I learned over my career. I've learned so much. And what are the really my values? What do I think about? And one of them is I believe in kids and that they have something to contribute. And not only do I believe in kids, but I also think that you have to foster that belief in them. They have to believe in themselves. So you've got to sell them in believing in themselves. And then I think that the sky is the limit. There are many kids that I would say, well, of course you can. What makes you think you can't? And in my head, I'm going, mm -hmm. but they would not only do what I said, but surpass it. So a lot of times it's just them believing that somebody else is believing in them that makes it happen. Oh, I love it. I've got some head nods. <laughs> Maybe I'll get some amens today. <laughs> that really motivates me, just saying. <laughs> so, and I pace like a panther and I act on people too. So if, if I act on you and you don't like it, I don't know what to tell you, you know? <laughs> I mean, y'all can hit me, it's okay. Uh, the next thing is to be real. You know, kids can tell in a heartbeat if you're real or if you're not. They can tell if you're scared, they can tell everything about you. Even the kids with the most complex needs. In fact, I think that they, um, well, we'll get that, to that in a second. But I had to be real because they'll call you out in a heartbeat. And so that's something I really learned that you just have to be, here's who I am. And you know, yeah, I'm scared too today or whatever, but to acknowledge that with kids because then that opens that communication. I have to be willing to laugh at yourself. Um, I remember one time, and it was way back when OTs were first coming in the school system, believe it or not, yeah, it was way back then. And I had the poster child for sensory integration. I had no idea, but this kid needed language. He spoke only in vowels. And he was in kindergarten and tearing that classroom up. So um, I told the kindergarten teacher, I had two little deaf kids that were in first grade and I called them Little Anthony and the Imperials because one of them was Anthony and anyway. So, um, <laughs> I said, well, we're doing language in my classroom, so why don't you let me have him and, and we can work on that. So the OT, you know, I, and I had seen an OT who was swinging a kid and I said, why are you doing that? This was a couple of years before that. And she said, well, we stimulates the vestibular system and helps produce better speech. And I was like, okay. So when I got Josh, then I, um, said, I want an OT evaluation. I didn't know what, it, you know, I'll do, I'll take him, but I want an OT evaluation. And she said, oh, he, he's the poster child. He, he would do things like he couldn't cross the midline. I mean, I found that just fascinating, like, whoa. You know, so, um, he was having one of those days where, you know, you can see it in their eyes that they're gonna have a fun day, <laughs> and you're gonna have a fun day. Well, we were having that day. And we had rolled on a mat, we'd done everything. And I'd sent little Anthony and the Imperials down to lunch and Josh and I were sitting on the floor. He was on my lap after we had done all kinds of rolling and everything. And my door swung open and there was the superintendent. And he said, oh, it's so lovely to see people like you who are so loving and nurturing to kids. And I thought, if you had seen me five minutes ago, you would have fired me. <laughs> because, you know, anyway, there were several times I got into those situations with kids. But to laugh about it and think, oh, this could be really bad if anybody saw this. You just have to laugh. You have to take kids where they are and move them forward, you know? 
we so easily, it's so easy to dismiss, oh well I don't do that, I, I don't know anything about that and that's not my area, oh I only do ears, don't ask me to look at their eyes or anything else, you know, and, and we can't do that. We just have to take them where they are and try to move them forward. You know, communication is on a continuum. They're somewhere on that continuum. Literacy is on that same continuum. It, they're somewhere on there. It's up to us. And then you have to consider the whole child, looking at that total sensory system. That OT was my new best friend. I love me some OTs because they've got some bags of tricks. If you don't know an OT and get to know them, please do. They have some wonderful things that can help you. And then, you know, every moment is a teachable moment. Every single moment, even if you're walking from your classroom to the lunchroom. Every time, everything, you can find something to teach if you put your head into that. <sighs> Kids manipulate. Yeah, yeah, they sure do. Um, I knew a young lady, Leslie who was very, very involved, deafblind, very involved, trach, G-tube, limited mobility. And uh, she had been with the same little group since preschool. And she was about middle school age. And uh, she had been with the same group and they would feed off of each other. It was pretty funny. One of them would call, start with picklehead. Oh, picklehead, and then they'd all get going, you know. Well, Leslie, if, if she didn't like what was going on, she'd hold her breath and turn purple. And if you didn't know that about Leslie, you think about how that could shut down a whole school system or a whole school because then 911 would be, you know, everything because Leslie would turn purple. The teacher would go, oh, let's suck it up. And she, and then turn this lovely shade of pink again. But, you know, you have to know that they manipulate. And they will, even the most severe of severe. And then kids will rise to and surpass your expectations, which I think I already talked about that, so I'm going to move on. And then avoid learned helplessness. Now, we're not going to go over it or anything, but in your packet you do have just a little two-pager about learned helplessness. Because if we're not careful, we really can cause kids just to, all right, you can dress me, okay, you can put my shoes on, you know? And it happens because we get in a hurry and we don't want to take the time. So it's easier for us just to dress them. It's easier for us just to get them here and there and do this, that, and the other with them instead of waiting them out and making them do it. So, just as a caution. Now, I want to talk a little bit about typical learning for a minute. And typical learning, what we usually do, we learn about 90% of everything we have, and you don't have this on yours. There are some that you all don't have because pictures don't do well on PowerPoint. So if anybody wants those, then see me and I'll send it to you or whatever. But I want to talk a little bit about typical learning. 90% of everything you learn, you learn incidentally. You know, it's like today. You've been to workshops before, right? So you pretty much already knew what you were going to be doing. You knew that you were going to sit here for six hours and hopefully the speaker was going to be enough, you know, entertaining so that you didn't doze off. Oh, please God, let this be not bad. And, you know, the seats, they're not going to be great. So by the end of the day, I'm going to be squirming, which by the way, if you need to get up and stretch, by all means, do what you need to do. It's not going to bother me. But you also knew you were going to sit down and somebody was going to lecture. You might talk amongst yourselves. You may do this, that, or the other. But you also knew when you walked in, you swept with your eyes how this was set up. Oh, good. Nobody's in the back table, so I'm going to take that. You know? <laughs> 
I think that's why some of you came early, but you know, that's all right. Sorry about your luck, ladies. <laughs> But you also, just by going into restaurants, different restaurants, you know whether the hostess is going to seat you, you know if it's cafeteria style, you know if you're going to, you know, it's a fast food order like that. So all of those things you've learned just by sweeping with your eyes or maybe you overhear something, those, that's incidentally, you learned how other people are acting so you just kind of do this and move on and life goes on and you really don't think about it until somebody like me points that out, right? Okay, it happens all throughout your life. The, you know, your first five years you probably learn so much of everything you're ever going to learn just that way. Nobody sits down and really teaches you those things, right? Okay, so the secondary is somebody like me who's lecturing to you. And that's, you know, teaching and stuff. That's a small percentage of what you learn. You, we think, oh, school, you're there for 13 years, and then if you go on to get a bachelor's and a master's and a PhD, you're in school forever, and that's how I learned everything. Mm, it's really this much. Most of what you learned, you learned incidentally. All right, and then there's a very, very small little piece that you learn direct hands-on. Very small piece of everything you learn. But if you have sensory challenges, then it tends to turn everything upside down. And with our kids with deaf blindness or other real sensory issues, then it's, it's completely flipped. Because really, all of their direct learning has to occur where you're really hands-on. And I've got a parent back there with two kids. <laughs> where everything is really having to be direct instruction, right? So much. How many of you have or have had a kid with deaf blindness? Yeah, so you know just how hard that is. You know, and even the more complex kids, just how hard that is and how you have to think in a whole different way. How, how am I going to do this? What, what's going to happen? How are we going to get this done? And so it really broadens your perspective on how to teach. And it really is, um, you know, mind-boggling sometimes. So, oh, how do we do this? So hopefully today, I'm going to give you a few uh, answers to that. Um, secondary learning for these kids is, is different, uh, is difficult. Very little will they get just through our typical way of doing things. And then incidental, depending on their vision and hearing, uh, that's almost non-existent. So we have to think about that, and I'm going to bring you back to this a couple of times. You know, just remember that incidental learning. And I want you to really think about that, you know, driving back today or whenever you have that processing time. I want you to think about incidental learning and how many things in your life you learn just by watching others. Okay? All right. So what has to be done in order to, to really get to these kids? How do we do that? How do, I mean, because if you start to think about, oh my gosh, wow, I've got to teach them everything, all these things that we just take for granted because we do take those things for granted. You know, how to line up with the other kids to go to the lunchroom. Well, if they don't have their vision and hearing, how do they know what that even looks like? or what we're talking about when we say line up, you know? Or sometimes I've been in classrooms where there are 10 kids and they don't even know who's sitting beside them. They have no clue how many teachers, I mean how many students are there, how many kids, all, you know, what's going on, who's doing what. Because they, if they don't have the vision, if they don't have the hearing to even locate where these people are. And I've been in many, many classrooms where that happens. So the first thing you have to do is build that trusting relationship. And I'm going to go into that. That's my next thing after this. But 
we take that for granted. We take that for granted. We think, oh, well, we're in school. Everybody trusts us. And it's not necessarily so. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Being predictable is also something that you just have to be. For these, this population especially, you have to be predictable. They have to know what you're going to do next and that you're going to do it this way. Because that then, think about how you feel if somebody throws you a curveball. But you have all of your senses, you have a lot of experience, you have a lot of concepts, and if somebody throws you a curveball, how that can really turn off your day and really rock your world. But if that happens to you all the time, every day, all day long, because the kid's living like this, because they haven't learned how to predict and how to establish those relationships, then being a respectful listener. You know, in the scheme of life, we have so many things, and as a teacher and as an SLP, all, when I say teacher, I mean all of you, okay? Because parents, you're teachers too, whether you signed up or not. You're teachers. So I'm going to just, when I say teacher, that means everybody in this room, all right? So when in the day-to-day, -day, you have to stop, your, your mind is going like this. And even when you're teaching your class and you're, oh, you might be it, <laughs> you're teaching your class and you're going on, you, and I'm, you know, feeding you. I might be thinking about 500 other things or I'm talking to everybody else, right? And who's left out? And I'm thinking, oh, I got to hurry up and do this because then I've got this and this and this to do. And oh gosh, after school today, I've got to go to the grocery store. <gasps> oh, what are we going to have for supper? <laughs> Your mind is going 400 miles an hour, right? And that's because we're all human. It's okay. But what I will ask you is when you are doing these kind of things with kids, and most of the time it's short. Most of the time, these interactions, if you really think about it, they're short. But the thing you owe this child, and it took me a while to learn how to do this, nothing else exists in this world. Nothing, ex what's your name? Beth. Except Beth. Beth is the only thing that matters. When I'm doing anything with Beth, when I'm instructing Beth, it's Beth and me. We are just doing this together, and I owe her, I owe her my full attention. And it's hard to do. It's very hard to do because we are human, and we do have 500 other things, mini dramas going on in our life. I call them mini dramas. <laughs> Because, you know, you think about it. From day to day, how many mini dramas do you, are you a star in? Or you're a... <laughs> some of you are stars, I hate to say. And some of you are, you know, just in there because you were drug in for whatever reason. You know, think about it. But I owe it to Beth to give her my full attention. That right there is going to help so many things. But you have to train yourself to do that. And you have to stop and think about it. So that's another thing I want you to ponder. I, I like to give people pondering things. Like, hmm. You know, because if you think about these things, what I'm doing is it's everything I'm going to say today, there's nothing you don't already know. But I like to take your information that you know and go just a little bit. Because that's how we have to deal with this population. That's how we have to think about these kids, is to take what you know and turn it just a little bit and think from another perspective. And I'm hoping, if nothing else, that I can bring the child's perspective to you today. Because here's Beth, and I'm feeding her, and I'm talking about, did you see those dresses those kids had on today? Oh my God. And, you know, Johnny's kids, I mean, Johnny's lunch, his mom, she didn't pack him anything. What are we going to do? You know, and we're constantly doing that and not paying attention to what we should be, which is Beth. Sorry to touch your head. 
I'm, okay. Um, I also have to be open to them. And I just went through that a little bit. Have those high expectations and give full attention and know myself. You have to know yourself, your reaction to touch. You know, what are we told as teachers? Don't touch kids, don't touch kids. Oh my gosh, be careful. <gasps> but guess what? With this population, it's all about touch. But you got to think about your own reactions to touch. You don't really think about that, do you? But you got to think about your own and you got to think about how that relates to that kid. What are they feeling in my interactions? And I'll talk about that a little bit too. The other thing above everything else is to preserve the dignity of that child. A lot of times these are kids that can't speak up for themselves. Or if they do speak up for themselves, it's like this. Which, you know, hey, some kids, I get why they do that. I would probably do that too if it were more socially acceptable. <laughs> okay, so I want us to think about a trusting relationship. Just think about your own life and think about someone you trust and feel comfortable being yourself with. You know, think about that person and remember a particular moment that maybe you both enjoyed being together. And what do you like best? What do you remember about that? Anybody want to, like... Feeling comfortable. You felt comfortable. So you felt like you could just open up. Yeah. All right. What else? Anything else? We laughed. You laughed. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you know... Sometimes when nothing else works, laughter. That's, that's my default mode. When things get really rough, then I have to find that warped sense of humor that I have, and I use it all the time. Because that's what gets me through the worst times in my life. It's, it, you know? And then what did, you, what did you enjoy about those interactions with that real trusting friend? What did you enjoy about it? The laughter, what else? Validated. Validated. Nice. Anything else? Nobody else has a trusting relationship? <laughs> Absolutely. You could tell that part of you that you don't often share with folks. You know, and, and you knew that it wasn't going to be like all over. Word on the street is. Yeah. All right. So why? You know, it's based on reciprocal, too. You know, I know, I, I have a real good friend that we laugh and say, you know, we have to continue to be friends because we know too much dirt on each other. <laughs> so we have to watch out. And two people taking turns. You know, sometimes it's me that's the drama queen and I've got all my drama, and then sometimes it's hers. Sometimes th then I have to listen and I have to be the strong one. We communicate about the same subjects. That's what drew us together in the first place is so many common things, you know? And then we understand each other. And we share our emotions. They get to see the, the more vulnerable side of us, right? There's also affirmation. You know, no, Nancy, you're not insane. You'll be fine. It'll be fine. You're, you did the right thing. Or, mm, I don't think I would have done it that way. But here's how you can save it. You know, so those things happen. There's also waiting sometimes and expecting. So sometimes I have to wait for my friend to be able to tell what it is they have to get out. You know something's wrong, you know something's going on, but sometimes you wait it out and sometimes you have to expect them to spill. And sometimes you have to kind of force that. Hello? 
What is up with you? Do I really need to get a plunger and pull your head out of where it shouldn't be? <laughs> Some of the other things that we use with our kids is pacing. You know, how many kids do we know that are just fast? Brrr. And we have to get in that pace with them and to get them to slow down, right? But we have to first get to their pace and then bring them back. Or we have these kids that are very slow and very methodical. And sometimes you think, ah, oh, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> but we have to pace, and pace ourselves to their pace. Then there's also using hand under hand. How many of you know hand under hand? Let's talk about hand under hand. You don't know it? I'm kind of a newbie here. Yeah, so I'm learning a lot. I've heard of hand over hand. Hand over hand is what we typically always hear. Mm -hmm. And that's where you put your hand over and you kind of force their thing. Well, in my world, that's not the best way. First of all, if you think about it, get your neighbor to just put their hand over yours and force them to do something. <laughs> What's your first reaction? Your first reaction is this. Get your hand off of me. But yet, what do we do to kids all the time? What do we do to them? We force their hand into like some yuck. Oh, it's going to be fun. Let's play with shaving cream. And the kid's going, ah, and you're forcing, it'll be fun, it'll be fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, any of you that haven't been guilty, you're lying. Okay. <laughs> All right. So with hand under hand, it really is a lot less invasive. I am also going to be, it's my hand that's going to hit that shaving cream first. It's my hand that's going to do those things. It also helps them to know where their body and how their hand is supposed to move in space. So to do that, Jenna, yeah. okay, um, which is your dominant hand? Your right hand, so I'm gonna use my right hand, her right hand, okay? And then I'm gonna slip my hand under hers and because Jenna doesn't have a clue what I'm doing, Right now, I'm going to just hook my thumb, or her thumb, with, between my forefinger and my thumb. All right, so try to pull away. <laughs> oh, let's see how you are. But I'm not really applying a lot of pressure, right? No. But I am, all right, so now I'm going to pick up the pen, and I'm going to write. Or if there's a spoon or we're cooking, I'm doing the stirring, I'm doing this, that, and the other. If it's a smaller child, I'm going to get behind her. Whoops. Sorry. Sorry. All right. <laughs> it's all right. I've fallen before. No big deal. <laughs> all right. If it's a smaller child, I'm going to get behind them. And this is called co-active movement. All right, where I'm going to help them to figure out how their body needs to move through space. So I can pick up her cup, we can bring it to her, we can do all of those things. I might even do that for sign language. Like I'm gonna say more drink, so that she knows how my hands are shaped, she knows what's expected, how far away things are, all of those things, right? Then, I don't always, once she figures out, and I've worked with quite a few kids in my life, and I do that, and a, a lot of times I'm called in, and oh God, there's behavior, right? And I'm supposed to, I'm the expert, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm supposed to come in and build that trusting relationship and run into kids and, and do this, that, and the other, right? So it's kind of like, whoa, how do I do this? So. One of the things when I do hand under hand with kids, and even if they've never experienced it and they don't really know me, there's this innate thing in them that they know that there's, I'm trying to communicate something. 
So I might start off that way where I've got their thumb or their, yeah, their thumb hooked so that they know I want them to follow my lead. But pretty soon I see them seeking my hand because they're like, I know you're trying to tell me something. I may not know what that is, but I know that there's something going on here that you want me to attend to. Even kids that are like very combative, they'll still come after me and seek it. And it's because they know I, I'm trying to speak their language. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. When we think about developing a trusting relationship, the first thing we have to keep in mind is the child's past experiences. That's how we learn. It's through our past experiences, good and bad. How many of your students started off in the NICU? We don't think about that. That's not the way it's supposed to start, folks. But unfortunately, it does for some kids. And nurses are very loving, trusting people too, but they hurt you. They're not doing it intentionally, they're doing it to save their lives. But then we fast forward and we get to school and here they're coming into a new environment. They don't know what that environment is. And they don't know that we're not packing needles. But see, we think in terms of we're at school, it's a safe and nurturing place. We're trusting people. We don't think about their prior experiences that maybe they have no clue what this is or why we're doing this or how did I even get here on that strange yellow box. We don't think about those things. We have to stop and think. I knew a mama once that told me that her son would just go crazy when they tried to put his AFOs on. And you know those, okay. He would just lose it. Well, they tried everything they possibly could. They, you know, it fit well, everything else, until the mom said, oh, she remembered that the sound of the Velcro was the same sound as tape that they would get ready when they were doing this procedure to him in the NICU. And this was 10 years later. So it does make a difference, guys. And we have to stop and build that relationship. We take it for granted because we are nurturing, kind, wonderful people, most of us. I've known a few that, maybe not, but that's okay. Anyway, but we have to think about their prior experiences and that that definitely has an effect on how they react to things today. Some of those behaviors that we see, some of those, um, these kind of things, yeah, some of that started way back then. So keep that in mind. We also have to be predictable. You have to let them know when you're not going to be predictable. Because sometimes we can't help it. Fire drills occur. And you know, one of the things one of my, on my dream list is to one day do a, a book about fire drills. Because even when we as teachers know that the fire drills are coming, we still go in and rip kids up and take them out. And we don't give them any kind of, okay, we're, this is what's about to happen. Not that we're supposed to, but with this population, come on guys, let them know what's going to happen next. If you know what's going to happen next, then you're more equipped. Right? If I had come in here today and had this great big box of needles and said, ah, oh, we didn't tell you, we're giving flu shots. <coughs> now, it'll be in a minute. Now, how, then at that point, you'd be looking at that box and you'd be thinking about how do I get out of here? And I don't care if I did a song and dance and all kinds of wonderful things. You'd be sitting there looking at that needle and the box all day long until it happened. Because you don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to happen though. 
and you build it up in your mind. So you got to think about being predictable and when you're not going to be predictable. And it's, once again, life happens and we can't always be predictable. But, and especially kids with autism, I'm going to go over there. Because those kids really, they like that sense of knowing what's going to happen. So, think about that. I need to be dependable. They have to know that they can count on me, no matter what, and be responsive. And sometimes, as I'm working with my friend Beth, and she and I, and I'm in the mode, and she, I'm waiting, remember how I told you we had to wait for that, wait and wait, and then I turn this way, and that's when she does it. Sometimes we miss those things. So my suggestion to you when you're working with kids is maybe videotape yourself. I'm being done that way today. You need to do that, not so much to, you know, send it to Hollywood or anything, but it's more about looking at that kid, looking at the things that you're missing. Because there are things that you're missing in those reactions, in those interactions with kids. And the other thing is we have to gain the child's attention. So many times we get on our roll, man, we got to get this done, this done, this done, this done, this done. And we're so busy doing that and we're just teaching up a storm. Man, we are just getting it. And the kid is still not even with us. They have no clue that we've done 15 things and we haven't. So the way I do that, drop down, hi Beth. <laughs> And I'm going to go right here. And I'll put enough pressure on her shoulder. And I'm going to drop down to her level. So that she knows. And I'm going to put enough. Uh, and then I'm going to come down her arm. And I'm going to go underhand. And this is interactive. That was coactive. This is interactive. And I'm going to say hi. And I'm going to put Beth, her name sign on her. It's Nancy. And then I may have, like, a, I usually have some kind of object cue that shows who I am. And it could be my ring. It could be whatever. Something about you that makes me different from you or anybody else. Right? And then we can go on with the course of our lesson or whatever we're doing. And I probably, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so when we do that, I'm doing an interaction, principal comes to the door. What do we do? We typically, I'm just teaching and Beth and I are doing something and then all of a sudden, bam, he comes to the door, what do I do? Oh, hi, <laughs> right? You, you need me? What? Uh, is that a pink slip you got in your hand? <laughs> That's not... Um, you know, she has no clue what happened to me. She has no clue. I owe it to Beth to let her know. Especially if she has no vision to see. Hey Beth, you have to wait. I need to take a break. Just a minute and let her know. When I come back, I'm going to stop and I'm going to go, it's Nancy again. I'm going to let her know. Even though, and I don't know how many teachers have told me, oh, they know who I am. I've been their teacher for 27 years. They know me. What are they, psychic? They may not know even your name. My little deaf-blind child, she'd always hit me right back there. I was like, yeah, I know, it's thunder thighs. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still me. <laughs> They're still there. <laughs> but you got to let them know your name, that your name is done on you, their name sign is done on them. So that they have that sense, because sometimes we forget about that. Okay? Then we want to expect wait for and acknowledge responses. 
And sometimes with our really involved kids, that's tough. Sometimes that's just a muscle tightening or a muscle relaxing. But we have to look for those responses. And I'm going to expect them. How do I expect them? How do they know I expect them? Sorry about that. <laughs> Know each other so well. I know. <laughs> Getting to know you. Um, I'm going to tap, and I'm going to talk about touch cues in a, in a little bit. But I'm going to tap and let her know. And my hands are also. Can you feel the? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm still here because she doesn't necessarily know that I'm expecting anything from her. Okay? We also have to identify the child's likes and dislikes, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. We're going to allow them, especially at first, to direct the conversations about their topic. Their topic might be, my little Shelly, she loved her some cookie sheets. And she would sit and balance them over and over. So we talk about those. So many times when I go in to meet kids for the first time, you know, I told you I was called in for behavior. And I'm supposed to, you know, you're the expert. You figure this out. And they're, you know, I'm checking for the magic wand. It's not there. And so I have to go in and figure out kids pretty quickly. And they need, I had to build that trusting relationship. And I have to kind of figure out what's going on. So whatever they're doing, that's what I'm going to do. So if the kid is in the floor and they're self-stemming, I'm going to get in the floor and I'm going to be right beside them and I'm going to do what they're doing. Now the reason I do that is two reasons. First of all, what are they getting out of this? Huh, well that kind of is kind of fun, huh? Because <laughs> I'm that kind of person. <laughs> but the other thing is I'm talking their language. And that gets their attention. What? That's my gig. What? You know my gig? Nobody ever knows my gig. And then from there we start a two-way interaction where we may do this for a while, but then I'm going to say, well, I like to do it this way. Can you try to do it this way? And we'll get it this way. And then they'll go back to this. And so I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. But now, let's try it this way. But that's, that's having a conversation. And that's using their language. Because you've got to make that connection first. You've got to make that happen before you can go anywhere else. So... Many times, well, we're the teacher and we get to say what we're going to talk about. Well, in these situations with these kids, we got to go there first. We got to get them where they are and bring them to where we want them to be. And I'm going to have frequent conversations like that with them. I'm going to think about how we can make it happen. Those may be spoken, they may be not. I usually will put some language with it, but a lot of times I drop my verbiage. You know, I don't sit and blah, blah, blah. I may, depending on the kid, just use like a noun and a verb. Or some kind of action. And you know, I'll go on and tell you this is my pet peeve right here. You know why? Why would, I, that, why would that be my pet peeve? More what? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. More what? Because more then becomes everything. Everything. And so then you get to be a nice guessing game of, well, is it this you want or is it this you want? What? Oh, well, what about this? I mean, we're so happy when kids do this, but we really need to think about more and putting what it is. And more also is very, very abstract. That's, that's just out there, if you think about it. So think about more what. And put that with, the, with this action. So that kids start to understand 
that I want more food, I want more drink, I want more play, I want more whatever. And then I'm going to incorporate rhythm and stuff. So now let's talk about communication since <laughs> that's the whole subject of today. So what is communication anyway? Communication is interaction. It's, it's that, you know, I mean I can talk to myself and do quite frequently, but um, you know, it doesn't really get me anywhere. It's better if I have somebody to talk to, right? And then it's a way to reach others. It's also a social act. I mean, we talk about movies or books or football or basketball. Uh, we're in basketball country, right? So we're, I'm a Kentucky fan. <laughs> Who said that? Yo, oh, yay. The exchange of a message. It's a back and forth between two people. And it's also just that connection. We all crave it. Some of us more than others. Some of us are very introverted and we don't need a whole lot of that. But some of us thrive on it. The older I get, the more that I'm more like, um, I'm not, I'm introverted, believe it or not. But, you know, usually I'm an out there all over, but I find that now I like that. I crave that alone time. It doesn't bother me at all. But some people are very introverted. But we still, all of us, need and thrive on connection. Even if it's how do I get to the Hilton Garden Inn in northwest Indianapolis, you know? All right, so ground rules for communication. All people are communicative. All. Did you hear that? All. I can't tell you how many times I go into classrooms and I'm, oh, he doesn't communicate. Right. We all do. Remember my friend Leslie, who could hold her breath. All of us, no matter what, we are communicative. Communication begins at birth. Absolutely begins at birth and goes forward. And our responses to people with disabilities can help or hinder. You hear me? Or hinder <coughs> communication development. And when we think of it that way, it's scary. It's like, oh, I could actually be causing them not to communicate because of that, oh, here, honey, let me help you. Here, I'm going to, oh, you don't need to do that. You, here, let me do that for you. And pretty soon, then they, you know, we got to be careful about that. Sometimes we will hinder. What's not necessary to communicate? Because, man, do I get the laundry list of what, oh, no. Mm, first of all, they have to know cause and effect. Then we'll start communication. Oh, well, they haven't learned that object permanence thing. Oh, no, no, we don't know how to, uh, mm, it's not happening. So we can't really work on communication until they learn that. Imitation. Matching. Matching's a big one, isn't it? Intentional communication, speech, and then AT equipment. Oh, we can't do, mmm. We, we need a device before they can communicate. If we just had that Dynavox, life would be rich. <laughs> and then, then they, magically, they would learn how to communicate. They're communicating now without all of that. You just have to look at it as communication. Behavior is communication. You know, and sometimes kids have learned, bam, hi, how are you? Or they've learned that as, I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, I want to go to bed. You're boring me to death. They've learned that because it, why? 
because it gets them what they want. Or if nothing else, it gets your attention. And then we get, oh, look, they have behavior. Did you see that? Jenna, did you see that? She has behavior. Oh, my God. And how many times do you see that? I see that a lot. Man, the, some, some folks get off on behavior. Oh, look at this. You know, and, so, and I stop and think, man, if I'm that kid, I'd be doing some behavior too just to watch your face. <laughs> <laughs> what is necessary to communicate? Someone to talk to. There's the first thing. So many times, folks, I go into classrooms and my guy that I'm supposed to be in there is way in the back because they just haven't figured out how to put him in there with everybody else. So it's easier, it, you know, he's, he's in his wheelchair and he's happy and he's fine and he can hear me. Oh yeah, we've got him engaged. So he's got to have somebody to communicate with, somebody to something to talk about. Something to talk about and a way to talk to each other. And so many times, if you think about some of the classrooms I've been in, it's been uh, not, that, not that pretty. Because the kids wheeled in off the bus and then there's diaper change. So we go and take them in, do the diaper change, then we bring them back. And then, oh, it's breakfast, come on, hurry up. Oh, did you sit, get everybody, did you get his backpack? And then, oh, it's circle time. Today is Monday. Today is Monday. You know, oh, what's the weather? What's the weather? And then there might be some kind of academic, but it's time for a snack. So then we feed them again. Oh, diaper change again. And then there might be something else, but then it's lunchtime. And then, oh my gosh, whew, it's nap time because poor Beth, she's worked so hard today. <laughs> what has Beth done? The teachers have run around doing all kinds of maintenance and upkeep and quite frankly to talk about pottying and diaper change and then a lot of the mush that they're fed. Really? That's what we got to talk about? We got to think about what it is we can talk about. And if I'm not excited and I'm not having fun, why would they be? We got to think about that. And if I offend anybody, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. So, we have to talk about form and function. Because that's basics of communication and you speech therapists are rolling your eyes going, oh my God, here we go. But, we do have to talk about this. Forms of communication or how kids communicate is through behavior, through their body movements, Sometimes they're very just, their muscle tone just tightens or it loosens. Sometimes it's just a finger. Early sounds, uh, uh. facial expressions, grimacing, smiling, looking puzzled, whatever, simple gestures. Concrete symbols, which would be uh, like a spoon for feeding. Abstract symbols, which we may use object cues that have nothing to do with anything. Because we're talking about Monday. How do you even show Monday? And there are all kinds of information. There's all kinds of information out there on tangible symbol systems and tangible symbols. And I suggest that you look for those and look up those if you don't know about them. Anybody does, doesn't, who doesn't know about what I'm talking about with that? You don't? Tangible symbols is something I can touch. I can feel. I can feel it this way. And sometimes we would use that with, there's a hierarchy of how, what you would use, but I might use those to represent the activities that we're going to do. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then sometimes combining abstract symbols. So sign language could even be used. Sign, and I'm going to pair it with something else. And speech. Okay. 
than functions or why kids would communicate. So most of the time it's to protest or refuse something, maybe to request something, maybe to request an action. So I want to jump or I want to climb the wall or I want to do whatever. Uh, greetings, so hi and bye, mama. Um, attention seeking. Then request for a social routine or a familiar game. Request for comfort. Comment on an object. Comment on an action and then request for information about an object. So those are the reasons why a kid might want to communicate. But we have to think about what it is. Why would they want to do that? So those conversations, conversations, they precede those, those interactions like I was talking about where I get with kids and we do whatever they're doing. Those sometimes are before kids ever know language. Think about new babies. We talk to them, we do all kinds of things with babies, right? Before we're ever expecting them to say anything. So we do those things and those, that precedes language for kids. Elements of a good conversation would have mutual respect. So I'm really going to respect what it is, even if it is that cookie sheet. Which, by the way, Shelly, my student, she spent the first two years in um, the NICU. And then she was in a foster situation where the next five years she spent more time in the hospital than she did at home. And if you think about where she was, she was in one of those metal cribs. And that metal, that cold metal, you know, it was um, comforting to her. So a cookie sheet is cold, it's metal, you know? When you think about where kids come from, why would she find a metal cookie sheet as, as her go-to play toy? Then you can track it back a lot of times. Um, the mutual respect, emotional and physical comfort. Some of our kids with charge have to be, because their vestibular systems are whack at, whacked out, and some of them are, don't have semicircular canals, so they shouldn't even be able to get up and walk around. But they do. But sometimes they have to be on the floor with their legs up and just in whacked out ways that they're in space, upside down, just to be able to attend to reading a book because otherwise their vestibular system is so whacked out they can't deal with it. Or sometimes kids, their vision is such that they have to walk like this because they can only see out of the bottom quadrant of their eyes. And so they're, you know, we're going, oh, well, they only look up, look down, look down. You're going to fall. Well, that's how they can see how to get around the room. So we have to think about those things. Topics of mutual interest. Like I said, you go to what they like first, then you can bring them over to what you want to talk about. And then there needs to be that comfortable pacing. That comfortable pacing. We so far, we get like this all day long, right? Because we have so many things to do. I'd rather you slow it down and especially at first. I'm giving you permission. I'm giving you permission to slow it down. I'd rather you do some really four beautiful, take your time interactions with a kid than to do 50. Because they've got to know, you got to start there with them. It'll get to the point, and we'll talk much more about that later, it'll get to the point that you'll able to add more to that, but they got to understand what's going on first. And then equal participation. We typically are the ones, ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop, and especially with kids that don't have any language, 
then we tend to fill in those blanks and move on. But they need to know that, now I'm talking to you and I really want you to be involved in this conversation. And that's sometimes hard to do, but we can do that. We want to establish an environment that respects the unique needs of kids. And that's up to us to establish that environment. We establish an environment that is responsive to any communicative attempts. Even if it is that hitting, yeah, I know you want blah, blah, but that's not how you get it from me. That's not going to get you that, and I'm going to show them how. You know, yes, I get you, I understand, but. And even them knowing that you understand is huge. Think about your own conversations. Think about when you're trying to get a point across to somebody and you're like, do I even make sense? And if they go, yes, yes, I'm, I'm with you, then that validates you. Well, same thing with kids. Even if it is this, yeah, I understand. You want a snack now, mm-hmm. That's not how we get snack. Or you want a break now. <laughs> but that's not the way you're going to get a break. Kicking me is not the way you get a break. No, that gets me right on you. Know that. And then I'm going to provide opportunities for choice making. Because with providing choices, then they have to communicate, right? They have to. And providing choices also leads from do you want milk or cookies to do you want to be married or divorced? You know, that's how we make choices and how we learn is through our choices. That's how we learn things. And sometimes we learn through our mistakes, right? In fact, that's how we learn the most. So sometimes we have to sabotage. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. We need to communicate, need, create a need to communicate. So sometimes we'll start on an activity and I may not have a, a spoon. Well, aren't you going to eat today? So that the kid has to say, well, wait a minute, there's something missing here. Instead of us being so responsive, yes, we want to be responsive, but sometimes we need to make them have to say something. And then we provide the communication system that the child can use. And I'm not talking Dynavox. I'm not going straight up there, folks. Sometimes it's some way that they can communicate. I went into a classroom one time where the kid was going along, everything was fine, the whole team wanted him to sign. It, they talked to him, he could understand them, but then she's ready for a break. <laughs> I, I hear you babe, we all gonna get a break here. But the kid started hitting himself and everything had been going fine but he started hitting. Well, I went in and said, oh, it's a communication problem. He doesn't have a way of communicating. And they're like, oh, no, no, we've got this. So I went back in and I had this lovely, what I call come to Jesus with the team and said, who in there is signing to him? You expect him to sign. How's he going to learn sign language if nobody is signing? And they were like, oh, <laughs> pardon the ring. <laughs> Okay, so we were talking about environments and making them responsive. And some examples of responsive environments is when you do, the child is addressed by her name sign when someone approaches. So, hi Beth, letting her know this is who you are because sometimes kids don't know that. They don't know. Or when you say their name, they don't really understand that that really is them you're talking to. You know, that, that sometimes is an issue. And so we have to make sure that you also identify yourself and them. Then a caregiver, before we just rip kids out of wheelchairs or we take little guys 
and just start to change their diaper, we let them know that first. That's respectful. That's something that you make sure that they know. I'm about to, and if you think about it, I told you, I, I was very upfront and said I act on people. And Beth has been wonderful, and so, so have you, <laughs> that I just all of a sudden pounce on you, and you're like, and now y'all have learned. <laughs> okay, here I am. Um, but... If I were to just rip you out of your chair and move you through space and put you down and start ripping off your clothes, which, how often do we do that? Mm, guilty. Guilty. I say these things not because, oh, I'm, I'm so special and, and I never do those things. Wrong. I'm human too. But we need to stop and think about those things. We move kids in and out and never think a thing about it. We are, our mind is somewhere else and we know, oh, it's diaper changing time and we just automatically do this as we're giving instruction to others, right? But if you think about it from a kid's standpoint, we're moving them through space. First, we've ripped them out, we've lifted them up and we're moving them through space. And then we plop them on a bed and start ripping their clothes off. That's pretty invasive, folks. Can we tell them we're going to do those things? Can we tell them why first? And also giving them cues. I'm going to change your diaper now. I need you to help me. Can you lift up a little bit? So I'm giving those cues to them to have them help me. First of all, then they can anticipate. And that's what we're after, folks. That's what we're after is, fo is kids anticipating. And if they can anticipate what's going to happen next, then they're with you. And they can also then respond. Think about your own life and think about when you look at your calendar and you have to go to the dentist. You may not like that, but just knowing it, seeing it, you can physically, emotionally, spiritually, and whatever else you need to prepare yourself to go. You still have to do it. And same thing with kids. There are things that we have to do with them that we don't necessarily, they're not going to like it, but we still ha they still have to do it. It's just the way it is. And it's not, oh, he has to go to the, do he has to go to the doctor. Let's not tell. Don't tell him. I think that's wrong to kids. They need to know what's going to happen next and what's expected of them. I do it, I did it, I, my kids are long grown and I have 10 grandkids, but I did it as a mom before we went into the grocery store. We'd park the car. We're going in the grocery store, we gotta get a week's worth of groceries, guys. We're gonna be there a minute. Here's what I expect to, from you. I expect you to stay with me. I expect you to do blah, 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 and blah. Then, you know, I remember one time um, we were going into a clothing store and I said, if you do this, we'd already run a lot of things. And I said, I had two at the time and they were four and five or whatever. Said, we're only going to be in here just a little minute. If you do this and hang with me and do, you know, act right in the store, we'll go get ice cream. They tore that store up, went into all the little, you know, under the racks and played and just had a big old time. I was like, okay, it's time to go. We got in the car, we drove to Dairy Queen and guess who got ice cream and sat there and licked it right in front of them. I behaved in the store. You know, I never had that problem for my kids again, ever. Sometimes we got to do those kind of things to kids. It's not a bad thing. It's you're not a bad human being if you make kids have consequences. It's called being respectful, but they got to respect too. And you know, I know how it is. When I first had my deafblind student in school, um, I had had her in homebound situation the year before and I was working in another county. Well then they hired me in this county and so I was new to the school and so was she. 
And you know, when you work with deaf-blind kids, they, you, you do it a little differently than the average kid. I was called to the principal's office three times in the first couple of months because other teachers, oh, did you know she's doing such and such? So, you know, I had to kind of, uh, and their other teachers are going to maybe, oh, you're making that poor child take their own tray? Oh, you're a horrible person. No, I'm not horrible. I'm not always going to be with that kid. I'm not always going to be there. And if I can teach them to do things for themselves, that's one step closer they are to independence. And that's my job. My job is to teach them to be independent. That's your job. And if I have to go around and tell you all, you have permission to do that and permission to say, mm-mm, you're not going to do that, then so be it. Because that also sets the tone for these kids and your expectations. It ex your expectations need to be up there. And the kids, they'll know. And I, I'll go back to, they'll rise to it. Opportunities for choice making, if we don't give them opportunities, they're never going to learn how. That's also a reason to communicate. You're going to do those naturally occurring things as much as possible throughout the day, as many times throughout the day. You know, sometimes we have centers or we have different activities that they need to go through and maybe they get to do the choice of when do you want to do it. You're going to have to do it today, but what order do you want to do this in? You know, much like I don't like to scrub potties, but sometimes I have to do those things in life. Now, do I want to do that first and get it out of the way or do I want to wait till the end as the grand finale of cleaning? You know? <laughs> so you have to think about how do we do this and, and giving them those same cho choices and same opportunities. We present those so that the child understands what the choices are. And sometimes we do choice making and not really, it's not really a choice. We have to think about that. And know what response you're looking for. Sometimes we do these things and we don't really think beyond the, I, I, I got to give them a choice, but we're not thinking about, well, what do I want them to do to show me that they're doing it? So we got to stop and think about those things. Okay, so incomplete parts. We may not have every piece of the activity that we're going to do, so we're sabotaging that creates that need. We may have everything except the vital thing and then we go to teach and the kid has to respond. So we want to set that need. We want to give them small amounts of a desired object maybe. So maybe it's like a snack that they really like and I'm only going to give them a little bit so that they have to let me know I want more of that. I may pause during a favorite activity. We're singing a song, we're just cutting up, and I stop. And wait for them to, and maybe it's this, maybe they still continue. And it's like, oh, yes, you want, so I'm validating too. Oh, you want us to continue to bounce or play or whatever it is. I may make a mistake. I may use a straw as a spoon. Here you go. We're going to try to feed you. So that I'm making an intentional mistake and see if they even understand or see if they even notice. Because then they have to communicate. They may, Wah! you're right. Ugh, what was I thinking? Because then you get their attention that way. Then it's almost like, oh, I got to keep my eye on Beth. She's losing it. So that also grabs their attention and keeps their attention. Then we want a communication system that's widely understood and used. 
Unfortunately, I go into many places where there are lots of the holy host of others, all kinds of service providers. And in the scheme of life, people come in and go. You know, I was itinerant. I was, I, you know, felt like I put out brush fires wherever I went. You know, and I hit and run. And I didn't always get a chance to talk to the teacher or, you know, the OT or the PT. We all came at different times, different things, but somebody needs to keep that centrally located. And we all also need to know what things mean. We'll talk about, in uh, this afternoon, we'll talk about some of the ways to do. But does the child consistently have a way to identify people in his environment? Like I said, we come and go. We know who we are. We assume the kid does know who we are too, but maybe they don't. Maybe they've never even heard our name. That's old Thunder Thighs. She's coming today. You know, well, Thunder Thighs does have a name. So we have to stop and think about, do they have a way to identify people? Do they ha and not just the adults, the kids. Because so many times, and especially in some of the classrooms where you have more involved kids, they don't know the names of their friends. Because they never interact with them, they are all so isolated out and different people are doing different things. So having that chance and opportunity to get to know your, your, your classmates. And what about, do they have a way of identifying places in their environment? And not just like in the classroom. There are different places within the classroom. But not only the classroom, but around the school. We're going to the cafeteria to eat. We're going to the gym. We're going to, you're going to the speech room. Whatever, they need to know those different and that they have names. We have to act, identify activities in his environment. So many times we get to going on whatever we're doing and we don't stop to really let them know this is a math lesson or whatever. Uh, does he have a way to request items? Does he have a way to request? Uh, and that sometimes that's, a, that's that initiating that kids have a hard time. Some kids have a hard time initiating things. But we have to give them first the input. We got to put it in before they can get it out. So we need to give them the names of those things and the way they can do it. Does he have a way to refuse things? He doesn't, besides clearing the table. You know, yeah, we know he doesn't want that, but is there a prettier way that he can do that? And then are there ways that he can ask questions? Oh, that's a hard one. You know, we're so busy inputting that we never think, well, maybe they do have a question. Or, yeah. And then make choices. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about tactile cues. Um, tactile cues, there are two kinds. There are touch cues, which that's where I use something on my hands, something with touch, some place on the body. So I might say, do you want to eat? And so on Beth, I would, do you want to eat? and touch her mouth. Then we can move that into object cues, which are everyday objects that are presented to the kid as cues that may be touched on the body. So maybe they touch this and that lets them know we're going to PE. Or we're going to the cafeteria or you're going to do this activity. So touch Cues and then object cues. And object cues are tangible. You touch them. You hold them. We have to think about teaching through the sense of touch. And with kids with deaf blindness, that's a lot of times, that's how we do it. That's how you have to do it. And depending on the child, depending on whether or not they need that extra support. Some kids have enough vision that they're able to do some things. 
but some kids have no vision, no hearing, and we have to do a much more direct. But hearing and vision are what's called our distance senses. So I can look with my eyes and see that Lisa's in the back corner. She can hear me from back there. I can send a message to her that way. Or if she were deaf, I could sign to her and she could see it. So using your vision and hearing. Those are distance things. There are distance and they're the primary way that we learn. And see what happens is if, as the teacher of the deaf, then I use vision as probably my main source of getting the information to my students. Teachers of the blind, they're going to use the hearing. But when you have a deaf-blind child, none of that happens. Or a lot of those things you have to, you know, step back and punt and go, oh, wait a minute, we got a little problem here. What are we going to do? So a lot of times we have to think about the sense of touch. Learners with multiple disabilities, including deaf blindness, have limited ability to access their, with the vision from far or even near, and then hearing. So we need some instructional materials that they can use to access to help them make sense of their day. Because we have to use just a whole nother. So I'm going to use my sense of touch or their sense. We also need our two best friends, the OTs. We need to talk to them. Think about how, what is it that this kid does? How do they relate? What are some ways? Are they tactically defensive? Are there places on the body that I might need to use instead? Another situation where I had to go in and this time, <clears throat> this was called an arena assessment. Do you know what that is? Arena assessment is where you have a child and you have all kinds of party players who are watching as you have a facilitator who's working with the child to help them to, you know, and then th they give party pieces. Like the OT might say, well, try this. And the PT might say, oh, if you use this. So, so you're, you're doing activities with them and then everybody's, get, you know, you're learning about this child. Well, I went into this situation and here's this little guy who's barefoot and he has an afghan that his mother had made and he's got his hands so tightly woven into there there was no way that I was going to get to his hands. It just was not going to happen. And I've got 15 people watching and I don't know this kid at all. So what I did was go with his feet. I started signing in his feet. <laughs> and I would sign, you know, hi, I don't even remember his name. Hi, whatever, and, and you know, he's kind of like, and I, it was a lot of hit and do stuff and then backing off. And then hit and back off. With the OT, she and I worked all day, we, several hours into that, because I would slowly work my way up his body. We finally got the afghan off of him and weighted gloves on him and were able to do stuff, but it took hours of us really working very hard to do that. But sometimes we have to think about maybe it's not going to go through here. Where are some other ways? What are some other resources? And that's where OTs are your best friend because they can really help you. Don't y'all love how I plug y'all? Y'all say, that's me. You can start the wave now if you want. <laughs> but impressions are used, are conveyed when you're touched. You are sending messages and these guys are hypersensitive to that. So you can tell when I mean business or when I mean business. Oh, I want to calm you. There are all different, but you think about your touch. If I'm in here and I'm a little scared of this situation and scared of kids, and I see that a lot. I, you know, kids can be scary. 
Kids, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm out of my element. Holy crap, what am I going to do? <laughs> and that's conveyed through your touch. And that kid's going, <laughs> we're going to have a good day. I was in a classroom in... And, and there was a guy who they kept saying, oh, he doesn't respond, he's, he's, oh, he's this way, that way. And, you know, I was already ready to go in and, and do it. But the lady I was with just kept saying, Nancy, Nancy, Nancy. And I was going, stop, stop, stop. And I finally had to do that. That's when he pounced on me and he bit me because I was trying to tell her, shut up, I know. Leave me alone. It's he and I. He's, we got to establish because he's got to know, mm-mm, I don't take that. But you got, it's all in your touch. And if you're nervous and scared, what do you think you're relaying to them? This is, uh, uh, that I, I need to be scared here. Wait a minute, if, they, if they're nervous. So you have to stop and think about your own, your tenseness, your tone in your, in your hands. You need to think about your temperature. You know, if you're nervous, you get clammy or if your hands are really cold and you're about to go in and work with this kid, then warm them up. Because nobody wants cold on them. Sometimes, right now I could use it, but you know. Uh, the speed of movement, the choppiness, all of that. When I am, sorry Beth, here we go again. <laughs> oh, she was like, oh, I'm on. <laughs> When I am expecting something, I have my hands out here. I've got kind of a, a little bit of a tenseness with it, and I'm touching like that. I'm flipping my fingers like that. And I'm, I'm expecting, that means you, I might touch on the top too. Here's another thing, so many times we are dealing with behavior. And here's how I deal with behavior. Come on, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you alone for a minute. <laughs> Tag, your it. Oh, do you want me to get one of them? <laughs> okay, so if a kid is going to scratch me or try to bite me or whatever, then here's how I deal with it. I do no. You know the sign? No. Everybody know, do no for me. Everybody knows no. I'm going to do it here on their hand. I'm going to no scratching. And I'm going to put my fingernails right there so that they feel it. Now I'm not going to scratch the kid. I'm going to give them just enough for them to know what that feels like. No scratching. And then I'm going to break. I'm pushing off and I'm breaking that interaction. No, you don't get to do that to me. No scratching. Boom. No. And then biting. I use my knuckles kind of. No, no biting. So it's like that. No biting and pull away. No hair. And I'm going to give just enough of a tug to let them know what it feels like. Sometimes they don't know that they're really hurting you. You need to let them know that's what it feels like on me and I don't like it. I don't do it. Does that make sense? Because I know behavior is a huge issue. But you got to let them know. No doing that. Oh. No kicking, I'll do like that. No kicking. No p Sorry. <laughs> it was mostly dry. Yeah, I was trying to be nice. <laughs> Any others? Hitting. Hitting? No hitting. Boom. But I'm breaking that contact, meaning, and a lot of times they'll come after you. They'll come back because it's like, no, I'm still, and it's like, I know you're mad. I got gotcha. you. I understand that. So you're validating, but no, you don't scratch me. Yes, sir? you wait after that interaction there? It depends on the kid and the situation. 
It depends, at least I think. Oh, you're, you're fine. You're fine. It depends on the interaction. It depends on the moment. I don't do that and then go and have coffee somewhere. <laughs> you know, we want to kiss and make up at some point. And not really kiss and make up, but you know what I mean? Would they need to know, I'm still here, I'm still a communication partner for you, but I don't accept these things. If you want to talk to me, if you want my attention, and a lot of times when they're doing those behaviors, it's because they want something. So validate what they want. I know you want a snack. Or, I know you want to go outside. Or, I know you want whatever it is. I got that. But that's not how you get it from me. If you want that, you tell me whatever it is. And you give them away. So that's that teachable moment. That's when it's Yeah, well, no. And then I say, we're going to do it one more. I'm always the, I'm the adult. And sometimes when you get in those battles with kids, then you have to verbally inside your head go, I am the adult, I am the adult, I am the adult, I am the adult. I will win, I will win, I will win. On the outside, you need to train yourself. You, and here again, I'm going to go back to you got to train yourself to, I'm going to take this, I'm going to be calm. The more calm you can be, and the more deadly. I used to tell the kids in the jail, you can know exactly. Here's how you know. First of all, my nostrils will flare, and then I will talk just like this. So I drop my voice, and I get very measured. And if you need to do this in that interaction, to get your point across, even if they're, they're totally deaf. If that helps you to regulate yourself, then so be it. Do it. But you drop into that, I am the adult here. You're going to do what I need you to do. We're going to do two more math problems. I hear you. I know that you don't want to. When we finish, that might be where you teach that if then. If we do this, then we get this. I'd have that preferred thing right after, that thing that they don't want, so that they start getting into, okay, I know that this is just a short period of time and then we're going to get to do something else. But you have to win that battle. Yes. And that's that teachable moment and, and you just have to set your own self up for it. And you set them up. We have to do two more and then we're finished. Two more problems, two more whatever. Sorry. Because I'm the mama and I say so, or I'm the teacher and I say so. I run this class, it's mine. You don't get to do everything you want to do in your time frame, it's mine. But you set your own self. I am the adult, I am the adult, I am the adult. And then you figure out, and sometimes we get into contests with kids and we get into battles, you have to pick those battles. Be very sparing in those battles. But no, when you do, you go for the juggler. You make sure you win it. Now you may all both roll in the floor for a while, <laughs> which, is, which is when the superintendent, right after that, the superintendent came in. <laughs> but you may have to roll in the floor, you may have to go to the mat. <laughs> but they will learn. Mm, that one, that one has a little backbone to her. <laughs> I'm going to respect that. I went into a situation the 1st of October where, you know, this kid is, oh, behavior, she'll scratch, pee, and spit, all this other good stuff. So I was prepared to go in and be, you know, I, I was ready. I really didn't have to do that. You know, if, if kids know, they can read you. And she was like, mm -hmm, I ain't messing with that. <laughs> I got you. Because I went in going, uh, dear, yeah. Come on, make my day, you know? <laughs> and it was like, whoa, all right. But you set the tone. But be careful because you could get into this match where you're fighting all day long, every day, and it becomes so, so use that very 
wisely. Pick your battles. But when it comes to, you know, scratching, pinching, all those things, no, you don't get to do that to me or anybody else in this classroom. Sorry. Or at home. Mm-mm. No, we don't do that here. Do you see anybody else doing that? Mm-mm. So, I'm going to get off of that. Okay. So, touch cues can help communication skills because it sets that anticipation. It's often used in early, early communication. Think about even with newborns and babies, how we automatically, we're going to change your diaper and you touch and, you know, all that. Oh, we're going to give you a bottle. So we are all, and it's pre-intentional, and it's, it's where we do the emergent, you know, because we really want them to start anticipating. If they anticipate, then they know what's expected of them, and they're able to anticipate what's going to happen next. They can make that association between the cue and the event. So if I'm like, oh, we're going to get you out of your wheelchair, it's time to change your diaper. So I'm going to say, it's time to get you out of your wheelchair, diaper. So wheelchair because they've got the straps. And then I'm going to, so I'm going to tell them we're doing this to do this. Then I'm going to go back and say, I'm going to take you out. Here, help me. And I'm going to give hand where I'm going to let her know, I need you to help. Now, she may or may not be able to help, but it may be that she can help. She's just never been asked to. So we're trying to get that to happen, right? And those are usually very direct. And then with everything that we do, it's, all right, now I'm going to get you out, and I'm going to touch here and here. I'm going to lift you up, and I'm going to touch. And I'm going to kind of hold it there for a minute to see if she's going to do a little bit of this. Because if she does a little bit of this, that's going to help me and anybody in the future. That's going to help us and it's going to be less strain on my back if she can help me in the least little bit. Then I'm going to take you over, I'm going to put you on the mat and I'm going to put her down, then change your diaper your pants are off. So I'm going to touch and hopefully, oh, lift your bottom. So I'm giving those, they're very direct. And it's usually right then that we're going to do something. So touch cues are used in a direct manner, right where you need it, and it's here and now. Okay? Uh, directly on the body. It's, it's for them to get receptive communication. They're receiving the information from me. They're made the same way each time and you teach all the members of the team those cues. Even if you post them up on the board or on a, on a poster. Beth's cues, Beth's touch cues. You know, on the shoulder twice means blah. So you're listing them so anybody and everybody, and you go over that in meetings with folks to let them know this is what we do, this is how we always cue her so that everybody on the team. And you as a team need to sit down and talk about that because what happens is I come in and I'm going to do this with Beth this way, Amber's going to come in and she's going to do it another way, and then you know, Beth's going, I don't know. Or they learn to associate. Oh yeah, with you, Thunder Thighs, I do it this way. With you, I do it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, which we're expecting the kids to do a lot that way. But unfortunately, that's what we do. Uh, used immediately preceding the action or activity. And used to alert them to follow the cue. So, uh, we focus the, that's also to focus the in individual on the activity or, or event that follows. And it's used to help them to anticipate and made with the expectation of some kind of response. So even if it is that they're putting their shoulders forward a little bit so that you can get their backpack off, whatever. 
we give the student time to respond. Sometimes we, in the throes of things, we do those touch cues, we don't get anything, and we move on. That's where we have to slow ourselves down and we have to go into what I call the rhythm of the child. Now let me tell you about my friend Sean. Sean had autism. Um, he'd do a few little blurbs that you couldn't really understand. He could walk, he, you know, pretty cognitively delayed, but he, he you know, you wouldn't think what happened happened. Sean was sitting in the classroom and the buses pulled up one afternoon. The windows were open and he goes over to the window and he's jumping and laughing and oh, bus here, bus here. And the window slams on his fingers. It took, and I'm not lying folks, a good 15 seconds. You could almost see the pulse going up from the wind, up there to his brain, back down to let him know there was pain. Bef and then, ah, it took that long for him to respond. And this was a guy that I would have never thought that. I would have thought, you know, how we, something happens and we have that immediate response. It took him that long. Sometimes we have to think about our guys, it's going to take them longer to respond. And we have to give them that time. We have to wait for it. It may be subtle at first. We may just barely get a finger twitch. We may get something. We have to ask ourselves, is the child responding as expected? Is he beginning to anticipate? So as you're doing this consistently, you're looking for those things. Okay? You're thinking about it and looking. What can anticipation skills, or anticipation skills tell you? They can tell you their ability. Can they anticipate things? How much wait time do you need to allow? And at first you may have to do a lot longer than you think. Just when you think that you've waited, wait that much longer. And then do they have the memory from previous queuing? If you've done it in a consistent way for a consistent number of days, because a lot of times we try something for a day or two and then go, oh, well, that didn't work. And we cut it out. Sometimes it takes kids longer and that's okay. We need to remember that and validate that. And then also their cognitive processing. Because I believe in life, if we teach kids how to problem solve, that is life. Isn't that what all of us need? You need problem solving skills. To get around in this world, you need problem solving skills. So we need to teach kids that and it starts with anticipation. What's going to happen next? Are you ready for it? How do you get ready for it? Uh, you may see evidence that it, they respond, that something's happened or going to happen. They may rise up a little bit to get out of their wheelchair. You, you can observe that if he's trying to help you with it. If he knows it's about to happen. So you have to really be watching. Then sometimes you just have to flat out ask yourself this question. What am I trying to convey to this child? And what response am I expecting? Because we put it on autopilot, guys. We do. And we don't think about, well, what am I actually teaching here? What is the lesson here today? Well, that's pretty stupid, really, if you think about it. Maybe we need to drop back and think about what I really want this kid to do and what I expect him to do back for me. And we don't ask ourselves that often enough, to be honest with you. 
Touch cues provide information. Sometimes it's, we're going to do this. We're going to change your diaper. Sometimes it's a directive. I need you to do whatever. And then it's feedback, that positive or negative. So sometimes it's that pat on the back or that no. Boom. Uh, selection of touch cues. Here again, some t mostly it's what you expect them to do is where you would place it. If I'm going to feed you, then I'm going to put the touch cue up here where I want you to open your mouth. Or if I'm going to change your diaper, so it's usually put there. Uh, it's, it's associated with the activity that you want them involved in and they're used consistently and you present the specific cue and then wait. So over and over again. So one of the things that you have in your folder is a likes and dislikes. And there are two of them. One of them is likes and one of them is dislikes. And they're in the right side of your folder, kind of in the middle. And they're not um, together. But this is a way of looking at kids and what they like and they dislike because sometimes this can be your road map. You also want to get everybody on the team, including the parents, and if they have siblings who can help, because siblings will know. Trust me. <laughs> siblings will know. If they had asked me all kinds of questions about Andy, oh, I could have told them all kinds of things that the adults were trying to figure out. Sometimes if you're trying to figure out things, you go to, let's say, the kids in third grade age, so he's eight or nine, I'd go to other third graders. Help me to figure out how do we teach him such and such. Because I guarantee you they can come up with some real creative ideas that you hadn't even thought of. But likes and dislikes, this is your road map. You can also then start grouping things and sensory wise you can figure out a lot of different things. You may be able to see patterns. So these are, and it's not just because if I say, oh, what does Beth like? Well, 99.9% .9 of the time every teacher I've ever asked that says, oh, they like music. What kind of music? Do they like rock? Do they like classical? Do they like, you know, little kid songs? Do they like the, what's the shark one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My little two-year-old grandson taught me that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, now they're going, what's the shark song? <laughs> That's at lunch. Shark. Do, do, do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, this, this ask you, the reason why I like this form is it gets into detail more. So foods, what kind of foods, what kind of textures go with those foods? You know, is it that they like crunchy things? Is it that they like soft things, soft and mushy? Um, also on the other end, on dislike, oh yeah, really likes crunchy, but do not give mashed potatoes because they'll gag every time. So looking at those kind of patterns, that helps you to know the kid more and it also validates them. And it helps with your instruction. You're going to use this as your road map of how to get there. Okay, so how many of you have ever heard of the communication matrix? Some, some, not everybody. Are you all speech therapists that did that or other? No. Okay. Anybody else? Speech? Folks? And y'all have heard of the matrix? Okay. This is a way of assessing kids. And it, it's, it's, it's a tool that really helps with children's communication skills. And the way it starts is there are seven levels. So they have level one, which is pre-symbolic levels. So level one is pre-intentional behaviors. Two is intentional but not purposeful. 
Three is pre-symbolic, non-conventional behaviors. And four is pre-symbolic, conventional behaviors, like pointing and such. So those are all without any kind of symbols whatsoever. <laughs> Then when you get to the symbolic level, you start with concrete symbols that physically resemble what they represent in a way that's obvious to the kid. Then you get into level six, which is abstract symbols. And seven combines those symbols. So you may do for two or three words. And then after that, or two or three words or symbols. After that, then this, this is not the assessment you need. But you gotta know where your kids are first in order to move them forward. So that's why you do the likes and dislikes. That's why you do this kind of communication matrix so that it tells you where this kid is. And so many times we as educators, we jump right on over to symbolic levels and we don't think about that pre-symbolic. And some of our kids are on that pre-symbolic level. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like. There are also four reasons to communicate. So those are refusing or, or rejecting something. Or sometimes it's getting what you want. Sometimes it's for social reasons, like greeting or gaining somebody's attention, that kind of stuff. Or for information. So answering questions, asking questions, uh, names of people, those kind, or making comments. So if you're doing the profile, it covers really the first two years of developmentally how we all develop. Those first two years. And some of our guys, even if they're 35 years old, they may still be on that pre-symbolic level. It doesn't matter the age here. It's more that that continuum that I was talking about, and some of our guys are at a really low level. And we, have, we need to look at that and see. There are three different versions. Here's the original, and it's very, and I'll pass these around. I do want them back and I will search you. <laughs> It's pretty academic looking and you know has all kinds of lines and all that good stuff and it was like oh my gosh and this was uh, created way back I can't remember in the 90s it's been around a minute then they did the communication matrix for parents it asked the same thing but it's in a very user-friendly format it's much more user friendly and it gives a little more because parents, you know, they're, they're the number one teachers and they're with that child throughout. We sometimes as educators like to take ownership and we think we know it all and we are the best. Uh, we haven't lived through everything that that parent has and we don't have the stakes in it that they do. We need to remember that. And uh, when I started asking parents, what do you want me to teach your child this year instead of, oh, I think he needs this, that, and the other. Then my life changed and my teaching changed. Because sometimes that parent would really love it if I taught them how to put their jacket on or to put their shoe on, or to take their shoe off. Now, as the teacher of the deaf, that's not really in my wheelhouse, but okay. If that's what you need me to teach you, your child, that's going to help them throughout the rest of their life. And, it, and it's nothing off of me. And I can do everything I need to do as a teacher and, and get to all of the skills and all of the concept, you know, all of my IEP goals. I can do that through whatever I'm doing to teach that kid, to do whatever it is to help that parent, because that parent's gonna have that child throughout. I'm gonna have them really in the scheme of life that long, even if I've had them eight years. And some of my kids, because I was itinerant, I had them from three through 21, so I had them a long time which is why 
I'm no longer teaching. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> actually I changed school systems because burnout does occur. Um, anyway, so I will pass these around if you want to look. When you do this, there's also an online version and I'll get to that in just a minute. When you finish, there is a lovely chart that's there. That it, and if you do it online, it's color coded. And here you can code it, but it shows you the things that they know they've mastered, the things that are emerging, and then the things that they aren't even there yet. And so many times, some of these early things, they haven't mastered those, but if we look at our IEP goals, they're down here. And that means we need to back up the train and we need to start back up here and start looking at some of these things. And what I love about this is it does give you kind of that road map of what you need to do. So, I'm going to, oh look at you. I mean look at Beth. Check it out. Look at that. I couldn't have even paid you to do this, sister. Just did it. Just did it. I mean, just did it as you were sitting here. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right, so there is a third, uh, third way, and that is online. And it is at communicationmatrix.org. And I promise you I don't get a penny for this, all right? But... It is, it is an awesome, awesome tool to use with kids. But what you would do with that is you go on and you create a profile. And then it's locked in. Then you can put your own kids. So if you're a speech therapist and 20 of your kids need this assessment, you could do all 20 of those kids. And it's saved in your little profile in your little place. And then you can go back six months from now, a year from now, and redo that assessment. And then you have it right there. You have all of your stuff. She likes it too. So the, what I like about it is it does give you that picture. It does give you that physical picture. It's also easy to talk to parents with so that you can show them, look, this is what we've mastered. These are the things we've done. And a lot of kids, they don't have, they may have splintered skills. Have you seen where some of yours have like patchwork? Like they have some, and then all of a sudden down here, it's like, what? How do they have that when they don't have all of these? But you know, that's how kids are. It determines what level of communicative competence to target and what they already have. So it starts with four sta three statements. Four statements, sorry. <clears throat> the first statement is, my child doesn't seem to have real control over his body yet. The only way I know that he wants something is because he fusses or whines when he's unhappy or uncomfortable and he smiles making noises or calms down when he's happy and comfortable. If that describes your kid, you press there. You start there. The second statement is, my child has control over her own behaviors, but she doesn't use them to try to communicate to me. She doesn't come to me to let me know what she wants, but it's easy for me to figure out because she tries to do things for herself. She knows what she wants and her behavior shows me what she wants. If she runs out of something to eat, she'll just get up and go get her own. So if that describes, then that's where you start. Then C, my child clearly tries to communicate his needs to me. He knows how to get me to do something for him. He uses various gestures and sounds like pointing, shaking his head, etc. to communicate to me. For instance, when he wants more milk, he might hand his cup to me or point to the refrigerator. He doesn't use any sort of language to communicate. Or, my child lets me know what he wants by using some form of language or symbolic communication, such as speech, printed words, braille, picture symbols, three-dimensional symbols, or sign language. When he uses his symbols, it's clear that he understands what they mean. 
So that's where you start with your kids. That can go any, any of those. That's, that's where you start. Now, if the kid has language and uses several phrases and stuff, this, you don't use this assessment. But anybody else, you can, and I know you're probably sitting there thinking about several of your kids and thinking, ah, oh, well this kid, that applies to this one, that applies to this one. Now then once it does, it kind of goes through some levels where, where it asks you a bunch of questions and it feels very redundant. I will tell you, it feels like, oh my God, I just answered that. Because it asks you, do they use their body? Do they use their this? Do they do this? You know, so it asks you the same series of questions over and over with every question. And that kind of makes you like a little bit crazy for a little bit, but it only takes about 20 minutes to do it. So it's not, you're not going to be insane for long, okay? When you score the matrix, then, you know, with the online version, it's, it's beautiful because it does print out that lovely, lovely thing. Now, here's what happens, though, is a lot of times people get the matrix, they do it, they get the printout. Can I borrow yours again? Look at you. I mean, girl. Assessment in process is all. That's all. I mean, and look at this. I mean, wow, speech path for life. <laughs> anyway, and very organized at that, way to go. <laughs> anyway, if you use the online version, it spits out one of these, which is gorgeous. But what happens a lot of times is you get it and you go, well, all righty then, now what do I do? Because it's kind of like, what, what do I do now that I know uh, we need to, he's emerging on protesting and continued actions and obtaining more and attracting attention. So now how do I do that? What, what, what am I going to do with that? How do, how do I make this move on? That's where... There are some things you definitely can do, and we're going to talk about a lot of that this afternoon. But the, getting back to the profile, because there are lots of folks in here who aren't like Beth and, and haven't seen this, there are four communicative attempts that are presented very vertically. So they're, they're along down here, and then the stages are down through here. So the seven stages are down through here. And they shade or color and use a different color or sometimes if you have to do this, you're not doing it this way, but you're doing it this way. And actually, we can, you all have seen the matrix? I'll take a look. All right, you take a look and then pass them around. But like I said, make sure they come back here today, please. <laughs> but, um, so, they use, you use a different, and it gives you that visual summary. It addresses specific intentional goals, sorry, for the child's current level. If the child has a very small number of communicative behaviors or messages at the current level, then you need to just continue to work on that level. Sometimes they're all over the place. You start targeting some of the behaviors at the next level too though. So you're going to look at that and we're on, he's on level two that you're working on some of those things, but you also want to look at level three. What's the next thing too? What are some other things that we can target? Because as you're doing your instruction, as you're trying to get them to go, you want them to be able to then naturally move into the next thing. Does that make sense? Okay, so some of the intervention strategies. If a child is at a, a level one behavior, then what that means for them is level one, they are just, think about a newborn. A newborn cries or may, because they're hungry, they're sleepy, they want to be held, but they don't really know why they're doing that. They're just doing it. And it's really, they have no intention with it whatsoever. 
Then as they get a little bit older, let's say about three months to six months and on, right in there, they start to figure out that they cry for different reasons. You know, like I'm hungry, and that's where you as mamas or daddies, you start knowing what they, what they need because of their cries. You start, oh, that's, that's a hungry cry. Or, oh, that's a sleepy cry, right? But see, they don't know that that cry is going to make mama come to them. They're doing it with intent. They, they have a real intention behind it, but they don't know that their communication is going to have an effect on you or anybody else. They're just doing it still. Level three is when they start really knowing when I cry, then people start coming. All right, so now I'm going to go right now to the intervention strategies. So with those, with level one, with that pre-intentional, you want to establish that purposeful behavior by creating that responsive environment. That's where you want to make sure that you're on it. When they cry, then you're going to start going to them. You're going to start letting them know, I hear you, I know that you're hungry, or you're thirsty, or you're whatever. Because they don't know that yet at all at level one. Your guy is at level two. So I want to respond to those communication behaviors so that he knows, he becomes aware, oh, when I do this, somebody's going to come. They're going to come and do whatever it is. That's how you start shaping that. Does that make sense? And you're going to set up situations that require them to be able to do that. And I'm talking about infants and toddlers right now, but really this can, this can apply to your 35-year-old. If that's where they are with their communication attempts, then that's what we need to do. So you're, you're going to provide those, yes, you want this. I'm going to be real responsive to it and I'm going to let them know. I get it. So level three, that's that uncon unconventional communication. So they might do it, but it may be something that they do that is not necessarily going to get me what I want. That's where they may get that hitting in there or those kind of things, right? So what I want to do is shape those behaviors. So if you're hitting me to let me know, hey, or hitting me, I want something to eat, or pushing me, I want, you know, blah, 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 that's how they're using it, then I'm going to say, that's not how you do it with me, or anybody else for that matter. We don't, we're not going to hit, instead, you, you use this. So you're going to supply them wha with what it is that they need. And then we're going to add those functions the reasons why, and we're going to introduce symbols. Now, we're not going to really expect them to really connect that, but we have to introduce them first. It's just like how many times do you talk to kids for at least, what, a year or so before they start giving you any mama, daddy, all that other stuff, but you talk to them. We're going to do the same thing with symbols. We're going to start giving them symbols or signs or something that lets them know this is what you need. You know, it may be pictures. So the pet symbols or any of that kind of stuff. So you're going to shape it. Instead of hitting, then you're going to give them the picture that shows that they're going to do what they're going to do or the object or whatever it is. Okay? The sign. Then conventional is when they start really shaping it more. But we're going to teach one-to-one -one correspondence between symbols and the things they stand for. So I'm going to start doing it in a way that everything that we do, I'm going to set up that day so that they have the symbols that go with what we're going to be doing. So that they have a way of understanding, this is what I want, here I have the symbol and I'm going to let you have it. 
We're going to start that kind of thing. That's where calendar systems or memory books or those kind of things come in and we're going to add those functions. Then when we get to concrete symbols, which is that, if that's where they're really understanding and that's where they are, we're going to increase the vocabulary of the symbol. Somebody asked me, do I just start with one symbol or do I do throughout the day? I do it throughout the day. I provide throughout the day because there are different words that I need for different things that I'm doing throughout the day, right? So I'm not going to just, oh Beth, honey, I'm going to only teach you cup. That's the only thing we're going to work on because I don't want to tax her. Poor Beth. I don't want to tax her. So, you know, she's got cup, but what about if she wants, you know, something else or she wants a toy? then I need to teach her other things too. I need to teach it in the context of what's happening. Now, I'm not going to bombard her with a lot of stuff depending on the kid. I'm not going to bombard her with a lot of things, but I am going to do it in the context of whatever that activity is. And I may start with just one thing. And I may do it like, and it's called anticipation calendar. So I may just have that and a finish box so that I'm giving her here's here's what we're gonna do and when we're finished she's gonna give it back to me in a finish box so she's learning also finished because where do we have the most problems Transition. transitions then abstract symbols that's where we start using like signs because abstract or speech because it comes and goes. I say it and it's gone. I sign it and it disappears. So that's where you're getting more abstract or even abstract symbols where I'm using a uh, symbol that represents like Monday. I might use that. Why would I teach kids abstract things like Monday? Why would I do that? They need to know what day of the week, why? Well, and also, we go to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We don't go to school on Saturday and Sunday. So that's where I start with kids, is today is Thursday. We went to school. We go to school. Yesterday was Wednesday, isn't it? <laughs> we go to school. Tomorrow will be Friday. We go to school. But then there are those times called uh, Thanksgiving. So that's some way that you can kind of explain. We're not going to school tomorrow. It's a holiday. No school, you're going to stay home. So that gives them a sense of time that helps them to figure those things out, right? Then level seven is then language, where I'm going to really explain that speech and that print or tangible symbols towards sentence structure. So I want to start working towards sentence structure. Some kids may never get off of level one. That's okay. Some kids may never get anywhere past level three. Okay. You still want to try to move them forward? But know that some kids aren't going to make it. But we want to at least give them the exposure and the experience. We need to try. That's our job. When using the matrix, to select, you can use it to make, set goals. And you want to specifically target communicative behaviors. So take into account when you're doing that, you want to think about their motor abilities. You want to think about their fine motor. That's where, again, your OTs, your PTs come into play. Your speech language folks. That's where, you know, it takes a team and there's a reason why there's a team. And, and it's easier and better, folks. When I had my deafblind student, we had four goals that every single one of us worked on. We didn't have the laundry list of 500 goals where I'm the, I'm the teacher of the hearing impaired, so I'm just going to come in and boom, I only do hearing. 
I don't think about those other goals. We did four goals that everybody did. But we thought about specifically how we were going to target those goals throughout. So OT, how are you going to target um, her initiating? And there's this thing called coach. Coach, have anybody ever heard of coach? It's, it's awesome for doing that. It's awesome for helping you to define and, de and decide. But that's, that's a whole nother, your deaf blind project can help you with that. Yeah, it's, it's really nice for defining and figuring out what, where to go and what to do with, with these more involved kids. And there's resources. Resources available, so see, I'm pitching for you. <laughs> then we want to target specific messages. You want to think about where the kid needs communication, where are the gaps that we need to fill in, what are the ways that we're going to do it, and new messages that might be able to come in and, and have the kids express. So that's where this lovely ways of communicating. And it's just a real simple little thing where it looks at the different ways. And sometimes kids will receptively communicate one way. They receive it one way. And they may express it a whole nother way. And sometimes kids will use like their vision even when they have a significant vision loss, that might be their first sensory channel. So it's kind of like, huh, how does that work? But it does for some kids. So look at the different ways that they're communicating, both um, receptively and expressively. This is just another tool because, see, first of all, you have to gather these tools. You have to think about where is this kid? How do we even get started? Where are we before you can move forward with how can I do something with this kid now? Now that I have this information, that's going to help you a lot in tracking and figuring out the kid. Then you move into instruction.